before we start this story, I just want to say, this is the strangest story you are ever going to hear, or, or you, you ever have heard in like any of the FNAF series ever. It is the most insane story that we have ever had. So you're not prepared. Like even if you think you're prepared, you're not prepared for what's to come. Uh, just as you think it gets bad, it gets worse and worse, I'm telling you. So um, <laughs> enjoy, enjoy this story. I'm gonna enjoy reading it. Oh my gosh, okay. Right, on the construction. This is unreal. Maya looked up and caught her reflection in the neon-bounded, mirror-tilted ceiling. By the way, I'm really sorry, like, I, I'm calling it Maya, I'm calling her Maya. It could be Maya, but uh, I call her Maya because I knew someone called Maya. Anyway, uh, her eyes glowed red in the blazing light. For an instant, Maya shivered. The weird radiance in her eyes made her look like one of the undead from a zombie movie. Maya shook herself and quickly shifted her gaze. Didn't I tell you? Jackson shouted to be heard above the blaring 80s rock music that pulsed around them. He brushed back his locks, took a huge bite of pizza, and looked and looked from Maya to their strawberry blonde friend Noel, who was gazing in awe at the bright yellow roller coaster track that wove in and out of luminescent climbing tubes entwined like snakes throughout the vast expanse beyond the dining area. Noel, her freckles standing out in the bright lights, reached for her soda. I have to admit, I thought Mega Pizzaplex was more hype than reality, but this is pretty cool. She sucked through her straw and bopped the music beat. Her ponytail swung back and forth. Pretty cool? Jackson dropped his half-eaten pizza slice. This is beyond cool. I can't wait to try a VR booth. AR booth first, Jax, Maya said. She looked past the string of zipping go-karts and focused on the glass enclosure near the pizza-themed Tilter Whirl. Every pot on the ride was shaped like a pizza topping. The large, bubble-like booth was the whole reason she'd wanted to come here tonight. Jackson rolled his eyes. Yeah, yeah, birthday girl, it's all about you. He flashed his signature mischievous grin and nudged Noel, who gave Maya a goofy look. Maya struck an exaggerated glam pose and checked herself in the overheard... It... There's a... This is a mistake. I'm sorry, this is a typo. In the overhead mirror again. In the psychedelic lights flashing around them, her long black hair looked like an oil slick reflecting a kaleidoscope. With her head tilted, her eyes no longer appeared red. They were their normal dark brown. She thought that between her dark skin and full features, her red dress and the red rose tucked behind her ear, she looked a little like a flamingo, uh, like a f flamingo, like a flamenco dancer. Maya returned her attention to her friends. She threw a ballad up napkin, a ball, sorry. Ah, she threw a balled up napkin at them. Just because I got to 16 before you two losers is no reason to hate on me. They all laughed. Maya noticed that the bark of their laughter barely made a dent in the clamor around them. The music, loud as it was, competed with so many sounds that it was hard to distinguish them all. Maya could, however, make out the clatter of the roller coaster on its tracks, the hum of the go-karts, the tinny music and pings and bleeps of the arcade games, the buzzing sounds of laser tag, and, overlaying it all, the sounds of happy screams and shouts and chatter. Maya's sister, Elena, not quite Eleanor, but close enough, would hate this place, Maya thought affectionately. Elena liked things quiet and peaceful. Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex was the opposite of quiet and peaceful. Elena would have hated the bright coloured chaos in the Pizzaplex too. Whereas Maya loved vibrant jewel tones, her sister was all about white and grey and pastels. Maya looked down at her blood-red dress, then shifted her gaze to Jackson's bright orange shirt and Noelle's hot pink blouse. She glanced around. Even their bright clothes were lost in the rainbow scape of the pizzaplex. Maya and her friends were squeezed into a corner booth in the main dining area. The, hu the room was huge, but it was so stuffed with shiny red laminate-topped tables and chrome-backed chairs that it, seemed si that it seemed smaller than it was especially because every table was filled with vor voracious families, kids, and teens chowing down on pizza. Servers clad in red Freddy Fazbear uniform shirts with multicolored glow necklaces looped around their necks could barely squeeze through the aisles as they rushed through the room serving pizzas and drinks. The swinging doors to the kitchen on the far side of the room were in almost constant motion. 
Everywhere Maya looked, brilliant colour and sparkling light beamed and blinked and shimmered. It seemed like everything in the pizzaplex was spectacularly illuminated. LED lights were everywhere. They formed frames around all of the tabletops and the flashy Freddy-themed posters on the walls and outlined the squares of the black and white checkerboard floor. Anything not wrapped and highlighted in LEDs was brightened by neon. Glowing archways formed the entrance to the dining area and to every other entertainment venue in the pizzaplex. Alternating with the LED-wrapped Freddy-themed posters, neon art in the shape of Freddy's characters and pizza wedges blazed bright in reds, gr blues, greens, yellows, pinks, purples and oranges. The mirrored ceiling caught all this light and refracted it, sending prisms of colour everywhere. Outside the dining area, in the centre of the pizzaplex's domed roof, a backlit pizza motif, stained glass cupola in the centre of the round mall's ceiling beamed streams of even more colour over the constant movement below. <clears throat> Maya thought that the effect was like every uh, was like a ballet of every tint she'd ever seen. The whole place seemed to flare and flicker in a constant motion of dazzling bright hues. You know 16 is just a construct, right? Jackson shouted. Maya flinched when a speck of partially chewed pizza landed on her arm. Yeah. She wrinkled her nose and brushed it off. She was used to Jackson spitting food across the table. He got so excited when he talked. When he got so revved up about something, his words would run together and he'd forget to breathe. At the end of his all-too-frequent monologues, he'd been gasping for air. A person's age isn't real, Jackson continued. It's just a thought. Its existence depends on the subject's mind. Noelle g groaned. Oh, not again. Can't we leave science in science class? Maya patted Noelle's arm in sympathy. However, the truth was Maya liked science, even when she didn't always understand it. Maya's main interest was biology, specifically botany. Or botany. Um... She loved growing things. Her mum said she was a born nurturer. But Jackson's musings about physics could be fun to listen to. Noelle frowned at Jackson. And besides, age isn't a thought. It's an empirical fact. Maya has been alive for 16 years, no matter what her mind has to say about it. Jackson waved as if swatting away Noelle's words. Maya stared at Jackson's big, dark hand. Jackson was tall and ebony-skinned. His mother was Jamaican and his dad was from the, that was from the Deep South. He looked like he should be a star basketball player, but he hated sports. He was all about science and philosophy. He loved to ask unanswerable questions and tried to answer them for hours on end. But what's alive? <laughs> Jackson countered Noel's logic. Is water wet? Um, he leaned forward, practically bouncing in his seat. Last night, I read an article about something called quantum immortality. It's a theory that says we never actually die. Ooh. <coughs> Noelle looked up at the mirrored ceiling as if it could help her. She sighed so loudly that not even the cacophony around them could silence her exasperation. I already liked the story because of the science aspect at the start. <laughs> Jackson ignored her. See, it's related to the many worlds theory. No matter which branch of reality you follow, your consciousness is experiencing existence. Each pass leads to more existence. We can never experience anything but existence. So we go on and on and on. Well, you sure go on and on, Noelle said. Maya laughed. Noelle didn't even smile at her own joke. She crossed her arms and gave Jackson a hard look. People die all the time. The idea of immortality is totally whack. Are you telling me that when my uncle died, he didn't really die? He, her voice rose at the end of the question. I, for some reason, I dropped my voice. I don't know. Are you telling me that when my uncle died, he didn't really die? Noelle had been very close to her uncle and she'd been shocked and devastated a couple weeks before when, he killed, when he'd been killed in, an, in a car accident. Maya briefly touched Noelle's arm gently. Jackson, as typically oblivious to real emotion as usual, didn't notice Noelle's upset. Well, quantum immortality only applies to the observer, so we actually can't know for sure if he's really dead. I mean, his consciousness could have branched onto a path that hasn't led to his death. No one has seen what the end game would look like because the observer hasn't been there yet. What seems real to us may not be what's actually real, so Maya noticing Noelle's darkening expression poked Jackson. You done eating yet? I want to head over to the AR unit. Who would want to do that? Who would want to head over to the FNAF AR unit? <laughs> Jackson glanced at his empty plate. He looked surprised to find it pizzaless. Noelle exhaled, as if blowing out her upset. She cocked her head and pointed at Jackson. Pizza is a construct, you know, Noelle said. It only exists in your mind. Jackson grinned. Touché, girl. <laughs> oh, I love that. That's great. 
he offered Noel his fist, and she, having apparently forgiven him his insensitivity, bumped his fist with hers before she stood. Mayor Jackson and Noel linked arms as they left the VR booth and stepped into the throngs rushing from one entertainment venue to the next. Noel squealed when she bumped into an employee wearing a Montgomery Gator costume. The faux green gator mascot patted Noel on the head and moved on. Roxanne Wolf is a great character, Jackson gushed. Did you see? Mayor tugged on his arm. Yeah, we saw. Hey, I let you drag me into a VR booth and now it's my turn. Come on, the AR booth is this way. Jackson resisted her. He pointed at a line twisting toward the entrance of the roller coaster. I want to go on Fast Freddy, Jackson said. It's supposed to have all the latest in roller coaster high tech. Jackson push, uh, pulled the brochure from his pocket. It says here that each car has a touchpad and you can pick your own music. Five genres to choose from. There are 28 LED lights programmed to change colour throughout the ride. Jackson pointed past the long lines. And see, it has a moving loading platform. It never comes to a complete stop. He waved the brochure. And it has cameras, some on board and some on the track. Lasers trigger timing devices and computers record the images and create a video that's synced to whatever music you pick. The video is downloaded and sent to that kiosk. <coughs> <coughs> oh god. Being Jackson is making me want to cough so much. Uh, Jackson pointed at a small hut-like structure that was covered in strobing lights. It's all done in under a minute, so you can get the ultimate souvenir to go. Now that would be a great birthday present, don't you think, Mayor? Jackson inhaled deeply to refill his lungs. That's what I need to do right now. <laughs> uh, roller coaster cars careened past overhead. Maya felt a rush of air brush against her face. The screams of the coaster's riders hurt her ears. She shook her head. Later, AR booth first. Jackson hung his head. Then he bowed elaborately. Whatever thou dost sayest, milady. Maya laughed. Jackson's southern, southern accent destroyed his attempt at Old English. Come on, she urged her friends. Noel and Jackson followed Maya's lead. She tugged them away from the roller coaster entrance and on past the giant swings and bumper cars. At first, Maya hadn't been in that into the idea of celebrating her birthday at Freddy's Pizzaplex. When Jackson had shown her the advertisements for the place, she thought they were so over the top that they were lame. She had to admit that Fazbear Entertainment knew how to make money. Before the Pizzaplex's big opening, the company sold thousands of mini hologram projectors at super discounted prices, and the first thing the projector displayed was a holographic Glamrock Freddy doing his spiel. Hey kids, do you want pizza? Well, Fazbear Entertainment has spared no expense developing the world's most extreme family fun center, Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex. At three stories tall, it's the flashiest, raddest, rockingest, safest pizza, the safest pizzeria the universe has ever seen. Of course, Freddy and the band are excited to meet you. Utilizing the latest in animatronic technology, you can actually party with the stars themselves. So, on your next birthday, let Freddy Fazbear's Mega Pizzaplex make you a superstar. Gregory, we need to vent. <laughs> I'm joking. Uh, it's the perfect place to celebrate your sweet 16, Jackson had said. Mayer had resisted Jackson's pitch even when he listed all the entertainment possibilities. Of course they have a stage for the animatronics performances, and they'd have an arcade and laser tag, he told her, but they also have a theatre, giant swings and slides and climbing tubes and rides, including a dope roller coaster and bumper cars and state-of-the-art uh, electric-powered go-karts and a sweet carousel. Oh, and carnival games, maybe I can win you a plush Freddy. Be still, my beating heart, Mayer had replied. What a great line. Um, when Mayer had kept shaking her head, Jackson had talked even faster. Oh god, this is like, the book is basically challenging me at this point. They also have sick VR booths and roleplay venues. Oh, roleplay. Uh, <laughs> don't take that out of context. I mean, one of the future books has a roleplay segment. Anyway, uh, it's their premiere attraction because Freddy's has always put an emphasis on celebrating birthdays. I know what VR is, but what is AR? Maya had asked despite herself. Um, Jackson's eyes had lit up. He loved explaining things. AR stands for augmented reality. It's a way of crossing the real world with the virtual world. Basically, objects in the real world are enhanced by computer-generated perceptions. The one at the Pizzaplex is supposed to be a really awesome one. It uses all sorts of sensory mod modalities Visual, auditory, 
some matter sensory, olfactory, and even haptic. Haptic? May I had questions. Haptic means to grab onto something. Basically, the AI unit at the Pizzaplex lets you reach out and grasp things that aren't even really there. AR basically plays with reality. The tech can be both constructive and de de destructive, meaning that it can add things into the physical world or subtract things. Whereas VR completely replaces reality with a simulated one, AR is a mix of the real and the virtual. The AR unit at the Pizzaplex is called The World Celebrates You. It gives the illusion that everyone in the Pizzaplex is taking part in celebrating you. Basically, it's like having a massive birthday shindig without all the money and all the trouble. It's the ultimate way to spend a birthday. This was what convinced Maya to go for Jackson's idea. Even though she knew her family and all her friends would celebrate her birthday, she also knew it wasn't going to be a huge deal. Her family didn't have the money for a shindig like she wanted. It sounded pretty neat to have a whole Pizzaplex full of people partying with Maya on her birthday. So here they were, and she wanted to get her party started. Maya and her friends had been at the Pizzaplex for a few hours already. They'd wondered at first. They even... they... then they'd eaten at Jackson's insistence, and then they'd gone to the VR area, again at Jackson's insistence. During this time, Maya had gotten a pretty good sense of the place. The Pizzaplex was set up in a circle. In the centre of the circle, ramps led down to a black light enclosure created for the littlest kids. The cave-like area was filled with glowing climbing bars, slides, and foam building blocks. All this was set up around a glitter ball pit. Padded benches for watchful parents surrounded the area. Above this subterranean play area, a grand de was, I don't know what this word means, I'm sorry, two-story theatre rotunda erupted like a fairy tale castle under the stained glass cupola. The rest of the entertainment venues and shops, of course stores, uh, in the Pizzaplex carried Freddy-themed clothing, costumes, souvenirs and toys, ring the Pizzaplex. Between these venues and the theatre, a go-kart track crisscrossed over and under the walkways that led from one part of the Pizzaplex to the other. Several VR booths were spaced along the walkways, and above everything, the roller coaster tracks intertwined with the climbing tubes. The two systems looked like a serpentine modern art installation, or a hovering serpent waiting to devour all the people bustling about beneath it. Maya dragged her friends through the crowd, yanking on Jackson as he tried to veer toward the role-playing area. Her gaze was set on the prize, the AR unit. It was only a few yards away and it was... Closed? Maya exclaimed. Maya stopped so abruptly that Jackson ran into her. Noelle ploughed into Jackson. The two grunted and glared at Maya. Then they looked in the direction of her gaze. The AR unit looked like a giant snow globe, only without the snow. Its base was bright red and inside the clear, thick glass, a throne-like gold upholstered chair sat in the centre of the clear bubble. A flashing neon sign blinked above the spherical glass. The world celebrates you. Neon stars and streamers, streamers, <laughs> just <laughs> people on Twitch, surrounded the world, words. <clears throat> Unfortunately, another sign was attached to bright yellow tape, similar to the crime scene tape, stretching across the entrance to the AR unit. That sign read, closed under construction. Under construction, Maya snapped. How can they make a big deal about a premiere attraction and not even finish it before they open? That's false advertising. Maya turned to scowl at Jackson. You said I'd get my big party. Jackson's usually animated expression was slack as he looked at the closed AR unit. His shoulders slumped. I'm sorry, Maya. I didn't know. Noel hugged Maya. Come on, it's not that big of a deal, is it? You've got us, and... She swept her arm outward to indicate all the commotion in the Pizzaplex. It's not like there's anything to do. Oh, sorry, it's not like there's nothing to do. Maya blinked away tears that had come out of nowhere. She felt like a spoiled brat for being so upset, and she didn't want to cry in front of her friends. But she was so disappointed, she'd really looked forward to using the AR. Maya glowered at the closed sign. Then she set her jaw and took a deep breath. Looked around. No one was paying any attention to her and her friends. She made up her mind. She rushed forward and ducked under the yellow tape. Noelle gasped. Maya! You can't go in there! Maya stepped over the threshold and looked back at Noelle and Jackson. Looks like I can. Are you coming? Noelle shook her head. She glanced over her shoulder and looked up. Maya followed Noelle's gaze. A huge mirrored curved enclosure loomed above a large area marked employees only. The space looked big enough to house all the behind-the-scenes offices and machinery that must have gone into operating something as elaborate as the Pizzaplex. It was clear the mirrors were two-way, 
and the elevated enclosure was where security kept an eye on the pizzaplex. Obviously aided by the dozens of CCTV cameras Maya had noticed everywhere she and her friends had been, Maya was sure a bunch of self-important, low-paid employees were playing Big Brother up there. <laughs> I get the reference. Yeah, they could be watching, but she didn't care. They can come and drag me out if they want, Maya said. I'm going in. Come with me, or don't. Noelle and Jackson exchanged a look. Jackson shrugged. What's the worst they can do? Throw us out? He looked longingly at the roller coaster, then shrugged again. We can always go home and work on our science projects. Noelle blew a raspberry. As if. Maya turned her back on her friends and entered the AR booth. She only got a few feet into it before she heard Jackson and Noelle rush in behind her. This is cool! Jackson circled the chair, then bent over and examined it. There's a processor under here. He gestured at the glass that surrounded him. The glass will be the display that adds to what you can see through the dome now. He reached down and picked up a woven looking headband that had been lying, almost hidden, on the chair's seat. This looks like a sensory device. See? He held up the headband and indicated a lattice work of nodes on the inside of it. I think this will augment your senses to make your experience feel real in every way. I think the way it works is whatever, Maya said. She darted to the chair and grabbed the headband. If security had seen them enter the AR booth, she didn't have much time. She took a seat. Maya slipped on the headband. She looked around. Nothing had changed. How do you turn it on? Maya asked. Jackson bent down. He fiddled with something. Suddenly, the glass walls of the AR booth disappeared. Maya could see directly out to the huge expanse of the pizzaplex, and it was filled with birthday balloons, streamers, and piles and piles of birthday presents. It was also filled with hundreds of people blowing noisemakers and cheering. It was as if everyone in the pizzaplex had stopped to focus on Maya. All the adults and kids on the walkways were turned to look at her. All the people in the dining room were gazing her way, their glasses raised. The rides were still in motion, but all the people on them were craning their necks to see Maya as they zipped past or spun around. Patrons and employees alike were smiling toward Maya as if she was the most important person on the planet. Surprise! They all shouted in unison. Maya felt a thrill of importance as she gazed out at the crowd. Then she teared up again when she spotted her family. They were all there. Her parents and Elena, her aunt Sophia and uncle Raphael, her aunt Luciana and uncle Peter. She saw all her cousins, even her favourite, little Axel. She saw her neighbours, the Davis twins were jumping up and down and waving at Maya, and the Thompsons, three kids, held a big happy birthday banner. Even old Mr and Mrs Lambert, the grumpy couple who lived across from the street from Maya's home, were in the crowd. Mrs Lambert held a, a plate of her award-winning coffee cake, grand prize winner at the county fair for 20 years straight, dear. Maya's love of that coffee cake was what had endeared her to the otherwise curmudgeonly couple. <laughs> uh, Maya saw her favourite teacher, Mrs Carpenter, and her minister, Pastor Ben. She saw all the members of her choir and her classmates from school. Everyone was wearing party hats and everyone looked like Maya's birthday was the happiest day of their lives. Happiest day, wink wink. <laughs> uh, <laughs> As Maya strained to try and pick out all the people she knew, the crowd parted and Glamrock Chica, her bright pink dress shining under the bright lights, skipped into view, heading toward Maya. She pushed a big cart. The cart held the massive six-tiered birthday cakes frosted in creamy icing and decorated with red candy roses, Maya's favourite flower. Sixteen huge candles flickered atop the cake. Maya realised she was... Wait, sixteen... Sixteen! Just like how many balloons there are in Happiest Day! Oh my gosh. And how many candles there are in uh, Princess Quest, but we don't talk about that. Anyway, Maya realised she was smiling so widely that her cheeks were starting to hurt, but she smiled even wider when Freddy's band started a boisterous rock version of Happy Birthday and everyone started singing along. Maya reached out and grabbed Jackson's and Noelle's hands. See? Wasn't offline after all. Happy birthday, Maya! Noelle hugged Maya, then stepped back so Jackson could follow suit. Maya smiled at the cherry scent of Noelle's shampoo and the smell of Jackson's pizza breath. She understood that the scene in front of her wasn't real. The pizzaplex couldn't have suddenly transformed into the birthday party of her dreams.
All the people she knew didn't just beam in magically, and the ones she didn't know of course weren't interrupting their fun to make such a big deal of a total stranger, but it felt real, and the familiar smells of her friends anchored her to what was really real. The combination of real and not real was heady. It spun Maya out of herself and into the fantasy of frolic and laughter. At first it felt like Maya was just watching the celebration around her, but as it continued she was no longer an observer. She was drawn into the party just as she would have been if it was real. After Freddy's band finished the happy birthday, everyone started chanting, Make a wish! Make a wish! Maya grinned and imagined having this, la this moment last forever. Then she blew out the candles. Their smoke spiralled upward as everyone cheered. Maya laughed in delight. Freddy's band started playing one of Maya's favourite rock songs. Jackson grabbed Maya's hand and he spun her into the crowd, which backed up and formed a circle around a makeshift dance floor in the centre of the walkway. Jackson and Maya weren't a couple. She thought of him more as a brother than a friend, but the two of them had always danced well together. <clears throat> Sorry. Jackson had some serious moves. <laughs> <laughs> and Mayo was naturally graceful. As they started popping to the staccato beat of the song, they slid into a series of intricate steps that they'd never practiced but had, have, had, but had to have looked choreographed to their audience. Maya felt like a dancing queen as Jackson whirled her and dipped her and even flipped her over his shoulder. When the song ended, the crowd went wild and more couples filled the open space as a new song began. They danced and danced and danced. Maya didn't know how much time had passed when Jackson, sweaty and grinning like a maniac, led her through the crowd to the cake. There, Glamrock Chica handed Maya a gleaming knife, which might have looked scary in any other setting, and Maya cut into the second tier of her gorgeous cake. She got the first piece, and she nearly fainted in bliss when her teeth sank into the, most <clears throat> into the moist pistachio and buttercream flavoured confection, her favourite flavours. Hmm... Several employees rushed out to help hand out cake. They all hugged or high-fived Maya as they passed her. She didn't know any of them, but they all acted like they had been long-time friends. The music was still blasting, and the crowd was still laughing and dancing and chattering. Maya felt a little like a bouncing beach ball as she passed from one group of revelers to the next. She was hugged over and over and over. She received kisses and pats and love yous from all her relatives. Her favourite kiss was from sweet little Axel, the lip smack was wet and sticky from the smear of frosting on his mouth. Yeah. <laughs> Time continued to expand and compress in an odd and disorienting way as Maya suddenly found herself seated near the massive pile of brightly wrapped presents. Her mum, after whispering that Maya's special present from her grandparents would come later as usual, began handing Maya the presents, and she opened them one by one. Most of the presents were wrapped in floral-themed paper. Everyone knew how much she loved flowers. All the gifts inside the festive packages were things she loved. She received vibrantly coloured clothes, stacks of romance novels and books on gardening, sheet music and CDs of her favourite music, makeup and jewellery, stuffed teddy bears, posters and prints of flowers and cute kittens, scented lotions and soaps and candles, a portable keyboard, a new guitar and finally a new laptop and a camera. These were to help her photograph and catalogue the flowers she grew, her mum said. The gift opening seemed endless. It seemed endless to me, that sentence. <laughs> Maya actually started feeling guilty. She was sure that watching her open presents had to be boring for everyone else. Whenever she looked up at the people surrounding her, though, they appeared to be enjoying themselves. They were totally attentive. Maya couldn't imagine a more perfect birthday celebration. She wanted it to last forever. Hmm. Maya, Jackson and Noel ducked under the tape and looked out at the boisterous groups of kids and families enjoying the pizza plex. I can't believe this looked like my birthday party a few seconds ago, Maya said. I told you it would be great, Jackson beamed as he designed the AR unit himself. As if he designed the AR unit himself, sorry. Maya leaned into him. Yes, you did. And you were right. I can't believe we didn't get thrown out of there, Noel said, looking up at the security booth. Maya followed Noel's gaze. She frowned. Noel had a point. Surely they had cameras in the AR unit. Someone must have seen them. Maya shrugged. Whatever. I'm just glad I got my big party. Now can we go on the roller coaster? Jackson asked. Maya laughed. Yes, let's go on the roller coaster. The friends linked arms again and they headed for the roller coaster line. As they made their way through the crush of happy people, Maya felt like she was more floating than walking. 
her virtual or augmented or whatever birthday party was the best birthday celebration she'd ever had. It wasn't that she didn't appreciate the birthday picnics her family usually organised for her, the potluck affairs that were always held in their yard and always included a basic sheet cake and cheap piñata, but she'd wanted the kind of party she'd just had in the AR unit. Now she'd had one. She was a happy girl. I admit that this coaster is flashy looking, Noelle said as they queued up for the ride, but I don't see how a three-story roller coaster can be much fun. It won't get high enough. She gazed up at the roller coaster's apex. It's not the height that makes it thrilling, Jackson said. It's the speed, and the loop-de-loops, and the other things. What other things? Mayor asked. You'll see, Jackson said in ominous tones. Mwahahaha. Noelle rolled her eyes. It can't be that scary, but it was. Mayo and her friends didn't have to wait long before they were the next ones in line for one of the yellow and red striped cars coming toward the continually moving loading area. The cars were big enough for three people, as if they didn't mind a tight fit. So Mayo and Noel followed Jackson to one of the cars. They pulled the safety bars tightly over their chests as instructed, and as soon as the bars clicked into place, the car disappeared into a dark tunnel. Rock and roll, are <laughs> Wait. <laughs> oh my god. They actually used the Monty line? That's brilliant. Rock and roll, right? Jackson shouted as he reached for the touchpad in front of them. The pad... Wait. 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 Yellow and red. Oh, never mind. I thought it was yellow and green. It would have been like a Monty-themed ride. Anyway, rock and roll, right? Jackson shouted as he reached for the touchpad in front of them. The pad was the only thing lit up in the blackness. Always, Noel yelled. Throbbing bass notes ushered in a screeching guitar riff and the car picked up speed. As it accelerated into a turn, a giant pirate fox suddenly loomed in front of them. Raising a gleaming hook, the fox swiped the sharp steel at their heads, just as the car jerked to the left. Mayer and Noel screamed. Jackson whooped. The car swung around in a tight loop, then shot upward and flipped over whipping them upside down into another U-turn, before suddenly flipping them back over and climbing. From that point on, the ride was a blur for Maya. Every few seconds, it seemed like another Freddy's character, lit up blindingly and larger than life, appeared out of nowhere and scared them silly. After the third jump scare of the shark- sh I thought it said shark animatronic, I was like, Felix? After the third jump scare of sharp animatronic teeth speeding toward her face, Maya closed her eyes. From that point, the ride was a mayhem of motion and sound and light flashing behind her eyelids. Thankfully, it was over seemingly as fast as it started. When the car slowed, the safety bars released and Jackson jumped out of the car. Noel clambered after them. After him, sorry. Maya brought up the rear, staggering. She was sure the ride had stolen some of her bones. Her legs felt like jellyfish tentacles. Wasn't that the boss? Jackson shouted as he grabbed Maya's and Noel's hands. Let's go get our videos. He pulled them toward the little kiosk near the, count, uh, the, near the coaster's exit area. A couple minutes later, they had their custom videos. Maya wasn't sure she'd even look at hers. She didn't need to watch a close-eyed version of herself being terrified at a hundred miles per hour, or however fast they'd been going. Jackson had kept yelling out the speeds during the ride, but Maya had, ig but Maya had ignored them. Now what? Jackson asked. Maya shook her head. Your choice, Jax. She'd come here tonight for the AR birthday party, and she'd gotten that. She didn't really care what they did now. It was after ten when Maya pushed open the back door to her family's small bright kitchen. She hung her keys on a peg by the turquoise retro fridge. Her parents, as she'd expected them to be, were sitting at the multicoloured tile-topped table, sipping hot chocolate and playing a game of cards. It was their sometimes pre-bedtime routine, and Maya suspected it was a good excuse for them to wait up for their teenage daughter to get home. Maya's mom drew a card and smiled up at Maya. Have fun, sweetie. Maya grinned. It was great, even better than Jackson said it would be. You won't believe everything they have there. The... Maya stopped. She'd been about to tell them about the uh, AR unit, but to do that, she'd have to tell them about the dream party with everything she'd ever wanted in a birthday party. She didn't want them to think she didn't appreciate the parties they had for her. Oh, and also sneaking behind security tape. <laughs> Did you go on the roller coaster? Maya's dad asked. I read about it. I bet it's pretty cool. Maya laughed. You sound like Jackson. You couldn't stop talking about it. 
Maya held out the videotape she got at the kiosk. Here's a video of our ride. You can see me screaming and closing my eyes as tight as I could get them closed. Maya's mother shook her head. Oh, that sounds like fun. Uh, her words were dripping in sarcasm. Maya went to her mum and gave her a hug. Laying her cheek against the top of her mum's head, she closed her eyes to soak in the smooth softness of her mum's short black curls, peppered with grey. Her mum smelled like jasmine, as always. Maya straightened, then stepped around the table and bent over to give her dad a quick hug. The top of his head wasn't soft. He kept his thinning hair in a buzz cut, which felt like a big burr against Maya's chin. But she didn't care. She loved her dad and the way he almost he always smelled like ink and toner. Maya let go of her dad and turned to the gas stove. Like the fridge, it too was turquoise and styled to look like a holdover from the 50s. She knew there'd be enough hot chocolate for her left in the pan. She poured it into a mug and joined her parents at the table. She took a sip of the rich chocolate. chocolate. Deal me in next round? Absolutely, her dad said. Maya smiled as she watched her, fa her parents finish out their hand. For the thousandth time, she thought about how lucky she was to have such great parents. Her mom, dark and petite and pretty, was a grade school teacher, but she always had plenty of time to take care of her family. Maya's dad, his plain face creased with smile lines around his eyes and mouth, ran an office supply and print shop. He worked long hours, but he somehow always made Maya and Elena feel like they were the centre of his world. He spent time with them every day. As her parents finished their hand, and her dad dealt out the cards for a new hand, Maya thought again about the AR unit party. She wasn't sure why it had been so important to have that experience of being the focus of everyone's attention. It wasn't like she was neglected. Maybe it was that her parents were so laid back that nothing had ever felt like a huge deal. Sometimes Maya wanted things to be, to be exciting instead of just happy. Maya picked up her cards. For now though, breathing in the aroma of the chocolate in the mug in front of her and gazing at her parents' content faces, she was okay with happy. After a half hour or so of cards, Maya kissed her parents, said goodnight, and headed down the narrow hallway to the bathroom. She took her time in the hall, pausing to gaze at the dozens of framed family photographs that covered the walls. Of course the photos had been there for years, but the party had reminded Maya of all of the people who loved her. She wanted to linger over their images for a few seconds before brushing her teeth. When Maya finally got to her room, she didn't even bother to change into pyjamas. She was suddenly wiped out. She just fell back onto her twin bed. She hit the mattress with such a big whomp that the bed frame scooted along the wood floor. Elena sat, in the, sat up in the other twin bed stuffed into the small room. Wah! In the muted yellow glow of a domed nightlight, Maya could see Elena's face was crumpled and her curly black hair was in a tangle. Sorry, Elle, Maya said. It's just me. Time is it? Oh, <laughs> what time is it? Elena rubbed her big brown eyes, ones that looked just like Maya's. Late, Maya hopped off her bed and moved to Elena's bed. Scoot over. Elena grumbled, but she scooted. Maya cuddled in next to her sister and wrapped her in a hug. Maya savoured the soft warmth of her sister's flannel-clad shoulders as she looked around their small bedroom. Containing just the two beds and one nightstand along with one dresser and a table that served as a desk for both of them, the room had been Maya and Elena's domain for their whole lives. Maya remembered when the, when the room had been painted pink and the bedspreads had been white and frilly. Now half the room was painted Maya's favourite colour, red, and half the room was painted grey. Maya's bedspread had a rose design, Elena's was pale blue. That sounds like a horribly coloured room, but uh, whatever, I won't judge, I haven't seen it. Maya thought about all the presents she'd received at her big per birthday party. She smiled. It was a good thing they hadn't been real. How would you uh, have fit all that stuff into this tiny room? Too bad the AR couldn't have conjured up a big house for her and her family. But that was just silly. Maya loved this compact house. It was filled with happy memories. How could a new big house compete with that? What's going on? Elena asked. Maya laughed. It's my birthday, that's what. Elena squinted at the glowing blue numbers on their clock radio, which sat on their shared nightstand. Not for another 42 minutes and 15 seconds. Maya laughed again and squeezed her precise sister. Close enough. Besides, I already had my big party. Elena frowned. But I wasn't there. Yes, you were. Everyone was. It was the best party ever. Elena wrinkled her broad nose and made a face at Maya. 
she wriggled free of Maya's embrace. You're weird. You're weird. Elena rolled her eyes and flopped back onto the bed. Get out of my bed. I need my brain sleep. Maya smiled. Maya's mother was always telling her girls they needed their beauty sleep, but cerebral and not concerned with beauty, Elena took issue with that. She said she got big brain sleep that helped her be smarter. I, I don't know why I said big brain when there's no big here, but that works too. Whereas Maya had gotten looks, Elena had gotten brains. Elena might have been shorter and plainer than Maya, but what she lacked in beauty, she made up for in smarts and confidence. Elena was a year behind Maya in age. She was years ahead of Maya in education and accomplishments. Maya was content to be a teenager. Elena was in a hurry to be an adult. She was a math whiz, and the following year she was going to be enrolled in the local college. Maya wasn't envious at all about Elena's brilliance. In fact, Maya was super proud of Eleanor. Uh, uh, Eleanor, yeah, sure. Eleanor. Elena. Maya was content to be Maya, and she had celebrated Elena's elena -ness. It had been, however, incredibly nice to be the centre of attention at the, at the Peterplex birthday party. Maya didn't usually get to shine like that. It was an experience she was never going to forget. The next day, Maya's family threw her the usual birthday party on the porch and grass in front of their house. Because the home's front yard was small, the party always spilled into the street and into the neighbouring yards. Even though decorations were minimal, the giant oaks and weeping willows that sheltered the small houses in the neighbourhood provided all the beauty Maya could have asked for. Maya's birthday was in May. Apparently inspiration for her name. Oh, that's the worst way to go. Um, oh, yes. Okay, so it must be May uh, instead of my, uh, because May. Anyway, uh, and it was always warm out this time of year. As usual, iridescent hummingbirds and fluttering yellow monarch butterflies were flitting around in the flower beds at the base of the porch rails in front of Maya's house. They were better than balloons. This year, besides the customary simple uh, happy birthday banner strung across the front of the house, the decor also included a sweet 16 sign Maya's youngest cousins had made. The big cardboard sign was lettered with crayons and decorated with glitter and childlike drawings of red roses. The piñata was a was the usual vaguely shaped horse form. Maya didn't even like horses, and the cake was a big flat chocolate one with a slanted "Happy Birthday, Maya" written in store-bought tubed icing. The celebration couldn't have been more different than the one at the pizza plex. The only similarity was the presence of all of Maya's family and friends and Mrs. Lambert's offering of her award-winning coffee cake. The cake was usually welcome. Oh, sorry, the cake was actually welcome. Maya preferred the apple and crumb topped cake to the chocolate one her family always had for her. Thanks for coming, Mr. and Mrs. Lambert, Maya said when she went to sit with them. They had bought their own folding chairs and had set themselves up under the gnarly oak under the street. They watched the party as if it was a war instead of a celebration, deep frowns etched between their brows. Hmm, Mr. Lambert said predictably. I hope you enjoyed my award winning coffee cake, Mrs. Lambert said. It was delicious, as always, Maya told her. She wanted to hug the old lady, but Mrs. Lambert's erect uh, posture and stiff shoulders were as good as a keep-away sign. <coughs> Apologies. <coughs> Maya left the Lamberts and headed back toward the porch. As she crossed the yard, she rubbed her temples. This morning when she'd gotten up, her forehead had hurt, right where a couple of the AR headband nodes had touched her skin. She had figured the headband had just irritated her skin, but the pain felt more like a mild headache now. Oh no, it's going to be like in the flesh, isn't it? <laughs> She's going to produce something from her brain. That would be a cool concept for the story. Like, she used to be about beauty, but now she's about brains because she had something on her brain. Anyway. Hey, birthday girl, Noelle called out. May have forgot about her headache and joined her friend. After the birthday cake had been cut... Maya and the other kids and teens took turns swatting the piñata. As always, the Davis twins, toe-headed Wesley and Wendy, singing in unison, were the ones who cracked the paper mache open. Or papier mache. Uh, then they fought each other for the first grab at the candy. Everyone else hung back. The tall and gangly 13-year-olds' competitions were infamous. This was best not to get in their way. Although this party did have a small table of gifts, the present opening wasn't a focal point of the affair. Maya's mum always emphasised that gifts were optional. Presence is much more important than presents, her invitations always said. 
She knew the people in Maya's neighborhood and at her school weren't well off. The custom at Maya's uh, family's parties was for the birthday celebrant to open a present here and there if the person giving the gift wanted to see it opened. Yeah, we do that. As usual, the most eager of Maya's gift givers were the Thompson kids. Donnie, 10, Parker, 6, and Aurora, 5, were Maya's three favourite kids, after her cousins, of course. She was their frequent babysitter because their parents, still pretty young because they had married when they were 18 and had Donnie a few months later, hadn't yet grown out of their need to party. They weren't clubbing regularly. They were great parents, though, and Mrs. Thompson was an awesome baker. Maya loved lingering in the Thompson's pristine kitchen after the couple got back from their dates. Snickerdoodle time! Mr. Thompson would say, and Maya and the Thompsons would each, each eat one of the big soft cookies while Mr. Thompson told jokes. His favourite jokes were typical dad humour. Knock knock. Mr. Thompson had said a few nights before, oh no, what is this going to be? Maya had answered dutifully, who's there? Alpaca. Alpaca who? Alpaca the luggage. Yeah, packer the car. That was actually awful. <laughs> Maya and Mrs. Thompson had groaned in unison. Oh, Jesus. <laughs> Mr. Thompson always managed to make Maya laugh several times as he walked her home. The cookies and the jokes were great, but the couple paid Maya well too. For the last three years, since they'd moved in a few houses down from Maya's home, the Thompson kids had made Maya birthday presents. The first year, they gave her bookmarks made from tongue depressors. Mrs. Thompson was a nurse. And crayon and glitter decorated brown lunch bags that looked like they'd already been used. Last year, she'd gotten a necklace made out of pipe cleaners. This year, the kids had all gone out. They'd made her a scrapbook constructed from more brown lunch bags and filled with glued on buttons, string, and photos of three kids. This is wonderful, Maya gushed when they insisted she open her present. I picked out the buttons, pug-nosed Aurora announced. She beamed with pride, and her brothers snorted. Well, you did a great job. I appreciate all the effort you put into it, Maya told them. The kids accepted her thank you hugs and scampered off to see if Wesley and Wendy had left any candy behind. Maya appreciated everything about her party and she had a great time playing with her cousins, especially little Axel, Aunt Sophia, or Aunt Sophia and Uncle Peter's youngest. Axel was a pudgy faced four year old with dark, dark eyes and a grin that never disappeared. Maya loved babysitting him, he was obsessed with patty cake and they played it so long that Maya's palms were sore when Axel finally got drowsy enough to curl up in her lap and go to sleep. When Aunt Sophia, her long braids looped on top of her head in an intricate knot, picked up her youngest son, she kissed Maya on the forehead. Feliz cumpleaños, mi sobrina. Thanks, Aunt, Aunt Sophia. <clears throat> Maya grinned when Sophia raised an eyebrow. I mean, gracias, tío. <laughs> Sorry, I mean, gracias, tía Sophia. Uh, Maya's grandparents had come to the US before they had their children, Sophia, Luciano, and Maya's mother, Violetta, or Violetta. Uh, they'd learned English right away, and they made sure their three girls were bilingual from the start. The same was true of their grandchildren. Between them, Maya's mother and aunts had given Maya's maternal grandparents 12 grandchildren. Sophia and Peter were responsible for six of those. Do we care about any of this, seriously? <laughs> it's stalling for time. Come on, get to the good part. Uh, Luciana and Raphael had four kids. Maya's mother brought up the rear with her two girls. Recently, Sophia had become obsessed with celebrating the family's Puerto Rican heritage and she was taking Spanish lessons. She was insistent that Maya learn too. Maya humoured her with the occasional phrase. Thankfully, Maya's dad's parents weren't as interested in their ancestors' roots. Mostly, we're Irish, but I think we have some Czech, some Greek and some Welsh in us. Maya's father had told her when she'd asked about it. She was glad no one was obsessed with that heritage. She couldn't even imagine trying to learn Gaelic or even more difficult Czechoslovakian. She was also glad that her father was an only child. Not that she didn't love her cousins, she did, but family get-togethers were chaotic enough without even more little kids running around. After Maya's aunts and uncles and cousins left, Maya and her parents settled in with Maya's grandparents around a small bonfire in the backyard. It was the family's tradition that the grandparents gave their grandchild a special birthday present after the party was over. Maya always loved this part of her birthday, just as she loved her grandparents. Maya's two sets of grandparents couldn't have been more different. Her mother's parents were dark-skinned, short and round, their faces lined from years of smiling, their hands 
Klaust or something from years of working. They ran a construction business. Under construction! Uh, in their early 60s, they could both wield a hammer as well as any of their younger employees. Even Mayer's grand could drive a nail in with just two strokes. Mayer's father's parents, on the other hand, were tall, pale and soft-looking. Self uh, Self-professed uh, aging hippies, Nana and Puppy, were artists, and the only thing their hands revealed were the colours of the paint they were using in their latest creations. They looked younger than their 60-some years, and they sounded even younger than that. So you're 16, Mayor, Pappy said, right, uh, Pappy said now. Right on, he patted her knee. Mayor noticed that age spots were joining the freckles on the back of Pappy's hands. Pappy reflected the Irish part of her dad's family background. Whereas her, whereas her dad had black hair, Pappy's hair was deep or burn. Because this is a special year, sweetie, Nana said. We all chipped in together to get you something, well, special. It's going to be like a CD or something. She looked at her husband and her gran and gramps. Isn't that right? Gran nodded. She pulled a small vel red velvet pouch from her pocket of her gingham apron, which she hadn't removed even though she'd left the kitchen hours before. She held it out and Maya took it. Maya pulled at the pouch's string and she turned the pouch over. A thin gold chain with a delicate gold rose pendant fell from the pouch. Hold up. Why is there so much emphasis on roses? I want to know. I, I want to know if there's... Like, you guys can look this up or theorize about it in the comments, but I want to know if there's, like, a a symbolic meaning behind using roses in a story. Um, I'm not sure. I'm not sure. It didn't really explain what Maya's connection with roses is, so that's interesting to think about. <clears throat> Oh, Maya gasped. It's beautiful. Nana elbowed Pappy. I told you she'd love it. Oh, wait, no, that's Nanny. Never mind. Pappy shrugged. He winked at Maya. I voted for one of those video game contraptions. I thought someone your age would want something more techy. Maya shook her head. I've had techy already, Pappy. She smiled widely as she thought about her virtual birthday party from the night before. This is perfect. Elena helped Maya put the necklace on, then hugged her sister. Happy birthday, big sis. Maya's parents and grandparents hugged Maya in turn. When they were done, uh, Maya's dad, Firelight, making the scalp showing through his thinning buzz cut appear to shine, got out his guitar. Maya and her parents and grandparents sang old folk songs for the next hour until Elena said her brain needed its sleep. When Maya settled under the covers that night, listening to Elena's snores, her sister always fell asleep in seconds, Maya pressed her fingers to her forehead. The slight headache that had nagged at her off and on all day was throbbing more insistently now. Was the pain related to her time in the AR booth? No, Maya thought. It was probably just a coincidence. She was simply overtired. Maya closed her eyes. It really had been a perfect, perfect birthday. She'd had her big party and her traditional party. All was well in her world. Maya closed her eyes and relaxed into sleep. When Maya looked back toward the end of everything, she couldn't easily pinpoint when it all started to go weirdly wrong. She remembered the first shock, of course, but at the, t but at the time, it didn't seem all that strange. Sad, yes, but not strange. After all, it wasn't unusual for 62-year-old uh, women to get breast cancer, and it wasn't unusual for them to lose their battle with the disease, even after weeks of chemotherapy and radiation. So yeah, uh... I do just have to say this before we get into it. It is going to be touching on cancer. So that's just a warning. Uh, uh, yeah, we'll talk about this at the end because uh, this is like an issue that I have with the story. But uh, we'll, we'll talk about it later. Besides Gran's cancer diagnosis, nothing out of the ordinary happened in the year following Maya's 16th birthday. So yeah, we're a year after now. Things were pretty normal, except for Maya's recurring headaches. The headaches, though, annoying, had never been serious enough for her to tell anyone about them. Secretly, she wondered if the AR booth's headband had done some kind of nerve damage. However, since the booth had been closed when she'd used it, she didn't think she had any right to complain to anyone about it. Besides, the pain was low-grade and intermittent. She told herself it was nothing. Maya's 17th birthday was nothing like her 16th. Although Gran tried to insist that the party go on as usual, no one was in the mood to celebrate anything. By the night before Maya's birthday, Gran was like a transparent copy of her old self, as if someone with shaky hands had tried to transfer her likeness into flimsy, 
tracing paper. On the night of Maya's 17th birthday, Maya wasn't sitting around a bonfire with her parents, sister and grandparents. Instead, she and Gramps, Maya's parents, her sister, her aunts and uncles and her cousins cluttered around Gran's bed in Gran and Gramps' living room. Gran had insisted on passing away at home, so they turned the previously cosy and comfy room into a sick room. It was a room barely large enough to contain all of the people who'd come to say goodbye to the wasted women in the narrow bed. And it was a room not nearly big enough to contain all the love the family had for this woman who was close to taking her last breath. The room was also inadequate to hold the grief that was born and grew to its full stature the second Gran was gone. Later, as Maya and Elena clung to each other in Elena's bed, Maya asked, Why Gran? Why not mean old Mr. Vance from down the street? I saw him kick his dog once. He's a jerk. Why not him? Elena hugged Maya tighter. Doesn't work like that. There isn't some good and some bad list like Santa has. It's biology and chemistry and DNA and... And BS. It's BS, Elena. It's just... Maya burst into tears. She touched the gold rose that hung from her neck. Oh my god, I, <laughs> I was about to let out a tear there. That's, that's a heartbreaking line. Jesus. Uh, she hadn't taken off the special necklace since she'd put it on. She held it right now, as if by holding on to it, she could hold on to her gran. Oh my god, I'm actually going to cry. <laughs> Why am I going to cry to this? <clears throat> when Maya finally crawled into her own bed and tried to settle in to sleep later that night, she wasn't relaxed at all. All was not well in her world. she just lost one of her favourite people on the planet. What would be next? The a- Let <laughs> I me mean, restart that. The answer to Maya's question came within just a few days. Pappy was diagnosed with cancer next. It was in his brain, and it was growing fast. He was unable to care for himself within a month of getting his diagnosis. Maya and her extended family took turns doing everything for Pappy. And before Pappy reached the end, Gramps got his diagnosis. He's not going to fight it, Maya's mother said to Maya's dad the day they got the news. Maya and her parents were at the dinner table, picking up plates of spaghetti. No one had an appetite. Maya's mother, though, was stoic. Uh, her eyes felt dry. Maya, on the other hand, felt like she was drowning in tears. She had trouble breathing, too. It was as if a big troll had settled on her chest and was squeezing the air out of her. Why was this happening to her family? As Maya got ready for bed that night, Elena sat in front of the computer they shared. If it was just Gran and Gramps, Elena said, tapping a few keys, I'd suspect something carcinogenic in their building supplies. But it's Pappy too. Maybe his paints? Maya looked over her sister's shoulder. As Elena clicked the mouse, the display shifted from an article to the world's page under construction. Elena, oh sorry, to the words page under construction. Elena sighed dramatically. <laughs> yeah, I like this a lot. This is great. It's a great touch. I'm going to bed, Maya said. Elena said, mm, and clicked the mouse to open a, few, a new search window. For the next several nights, Elena stayed up late, researching the causes of cancer. Maya wasn't good at research, so she spent her spare time reading to her grandfathers. Pappy, of course, didn't understand her anymore, but she knew he was aware of her presence. Gramps kept telling her she should stop wasting her time catering to a dying old fart. You should be out on a date. She told her several times. Maya tried to remember the last time she'd cared about going on a date. Just a few months before, she'd had a crush on the junior varsity quarterback. Now, when she looked at his carefree grin and his trussled hair, or tousled hair, or whatever, she just felt annoyed. Wrapped up as she was with her sick grandparents, Maya didn't pay any attention to what was going on with anyone else. It was only after Nana got cancer and died just days after Gramps and Pappy were gone, that Maya emerged from her grief fog enough to notice that people all around her were getting the dreaded disease. Mr. and Mrs. Lambert succumbed not long after Maya's grandparents passed. Maya didn't even know they'd been sick until their grown children showed up to close up and sell the house. Maya felt bad when she found out. She hadn't been over to see them since Gran had gotten sick. Weirdly, she vaguely wondered what would become of Mrs. Lambert's award-winning coffee cake recipe. This is horrible. Uh, this obviously isn't how cancer works in real life. And this is also why I kind of wish they didn't use can Like, this is my main problem with it. I wish they didn't use cancer. I wish they used, like, Faz disease or something. <laughs> um, although that would have just been comedic. But, like, 
cancer is non-communicable, it can't be passed on, it doesn't really work like this. Um, I think it is actually genetic. I don't know, do your research, but, um, you know, this isn't necessarily how cancer works in the real world, so. It's still terrifying though, still very scary. But she didn't think about that for long. Mr. and Mrs. Davis were diagnosed next, then Mr. and Mrs. Thompson. Maya hadn't even noticed she hadn't asked to babysit for a while because she'd been so preoccupied with her grandparents. When she found out they were sick, she went to see the Thompsons and she offered to help take care of them and the kids. She did the same for the Davis family. Running back and forth between the two homes and her own took up all her free time after school. At school, she was barely conscious. However, she was aware enough to notice that she was hearing the word cancer far more than she should have been. My brother was admitted to the oncology ward last night. Bryn, the varsity head cheerleader, said to her crew, oh, that was a woman, uh, as Maya shuffled past their table in the noisy cafeteria. We're taking care of my sister at home, Bryn's best friend, Mackenzie, said. The hospital said the oncology ward is full. Actually, there aren't any beds in the whole hospital. When people go to the ER, they park the beds in the hallway. Bryn had no response to that. The other girls at the table were equally unconcerned. Maya stopped and stared at them. They didn't notice her. Did you try that new mascara I told you about? Bryn asked one of the other girls. The girl, a pretty blonde, fluttered her eyelashes. Can't you tell? Everyone at the table admired the girl's long lashes. Maya shook her head and took her tray over to the table where Jackson and Noel were already seated. Maya flopped into a plastic chair and slammed her tray on the scarred, laminate-topped table. She gestured toward the cheerleader's table. Can you believe them? They're acting like it's no big deal. Like what's no big deal? Noelle said. Maya frowned at her friend. All the cancer. Jackson shrugged. My mum was diagnosed last week. Maya's mouth dropped open. I'm so sorry, you didn't say anything. What's to say? Jackson asked. He dug into the chilli on his tray. The pungent scents of tomato and onion filled the air. You all want to go to the pizza flex this weekend? Apparently the new animatronics show is pretty incredible. Maya stared at Jackson. She shifted her gaze to Noelle, who was nibbling at a salad. Noelle was totally relaxed. <coughs> Apologies again. I'm coughing a lot because this is... I'm talking a lot. I've been talking a lot for like the past three days. Um, Seriously? Maya said. The word came out high-pitched and too loud. Jackson and Noel frowned at Maya. Several kids at neighbouring tables turned and looked at Maya with raised eyebrows. Maya lowered her voice and leaned toward her friends. Why are you acting like everything's normal? Jackson and Noel exchanged a baffled look. Jackson gazed across the table at Maya. Um, because everything is normal? Maya slapped her hand on the table. The thwack cut through the chaotic conversations and the tinkling cutlery th sounds in the room. For a second, the sound so stopped and several heads rotated Maya's way. Maya ignored the scrutiny. She kept her voice low and steady when she spoke again. Haven't you noticed that it seems like everyone's getting cancer? My aunt Sophia was just diagnosed, my uncle Raphael was diagnosed a month ago, and my grandparents have all died of it in the last 13 months. It's weird. Something's going on. Jackson shrugged. Cancer sucks, for sure. But there's nothing weird about it. Maya opened her mouth to argue, but what was the point? She picked up her tray and stomped out of the cafeteria. She no longer wanted to hang around with her friends. They were clueless. She couldn't stand looking at their carefree faces. Over the next few weeks, Maya saw less and less of Jackson and Noelle. Summer arrived and her friends got jobs at the local burger joint. Maya didn't have time for a job. She split her time between the hospital where she'd sit with her aunts and uncles. Aunt Lucia and Uncle Peter had cancer now too. While they received chemo in her aunts and uncles' houses where she would help take care of their older cousins, four of whom were now dying of cancer. She also still helped out the Davises and the Thompsons. Maya spent her days making food, changing sheets, emptying bedpans and do do doling, <laughs> doling out medications. She spent her nights tossing and turning and listening to Elena snore. When Maya's grandparents had gotten sick, Elena had been a com com compatriot in Maya's needs for answers. But Elena had long since stopped going to the library. When Maya would ask her why so many people were dying of cancer, Elena would just shrug and stick her nose back in her latest math te textbook. Maya sometimes thought of trying to figure out what was going on herself. Although she didn't like doing research, she knew how. But when did she have the time? She was too busy taking care of sick people. One afternoon in, 
one afternoon, sorry, in late August, just days from the start of Maya's senior year, Maya finally got a bit of good news. Her favourite teacher, Mrs Carpenter, had her first baby. Noelle stopped by to tell Maya about it. The two girls stood in front of the washer and dryer in Maya's house. Maya's father had been sick for a month. Because her mum was focused on caring for him, Maya was now doing everything else in the house. The cooking, the cleaning, the shopping, the laundry, even paying the bills. She wasn't sure how much longer she'd be able to do that. Her dad's chemo treatment was making him really weak. How long would we be able to keep working? How'd you hear? Maya asked as she and Noelle folded a sheet. My mum is in the hospice ward at the hospital. When I get bored sitting in with her, uh, I go to the nursery to look at the babies. Uh, Maya wanted to call Noelle out on the offhand way she talked about her mother's condition, but she also wanted, to, wanted more to focus on something hopeful for a change. A new baby was hopeful. Is she still in the hospital? Maya asked. Mrs Carpenter, that is. Ne Noelle shook her head. I think she and the baby went home. Noelle's eyes lit up. Do you want to go see them? Maya nodded. She, didn't, she doesn't live too far out from here. Let's ride our bikes. It took only 15 minutes for Maya and no Noelle to pedal the few blocks to Mrs Carpenter's house. They reached the small cottage-style home just as the summer storm cloud released a downpour and thunder rumbled across the sky. They dropped their bikes in the narrow driveway and scurried to the covered front porch. When they knocked, lightning lit up the sky behind them. Thunder sounded again just seconds later as Mrs. Carpenter opened her door. Girls, what a nice surprise. Mrs. Carpenter wasn't a whole lot older than Maya and Noelle. She'd started teaching in Maya's sophomore year. She was a tall, slender woman with wavy brown hair and bright green eyes. She could easily have passed for a teenager, even now standing in her entryway holding a blanketed bundle to her shoulder. Maya craned her neck to get a glimpse of the child. Congratulations, Maya said. We came to see your baby. Maya held out a bunch of roses she picked from her backyard right before she and Noelle had hopped onto their bikes. With everything that was going on, Maya hadn't had time to tend her flowers, but they seemed to be taking care of themselves. The peach-coloured blooms in Maya's hand were healthy and fragrant. As she held out the flowers, it suddenly occurred to Maya that they should have brought something for the baby. Oh, I'm sorry, Maya blurted. We should have bought a toy or something for her. Her or him? Mrs. Carpenter backed up and motioned for the girls to come into her house. They stepped into a cramped but tidy living room. It was bright with white walls and yellow upholstered furniture. The room smelled like lemon furniture polish. And the whole house smelled like a fresh brewed coffee. This surprised Maya. She'd been in her aunt's and uncle's homes after each of her youngest cousins had been born. Their houses has always smelled like a mixture, mixture of dirty diapers and talc and spit up and sweet milk. It was what Maya thought of as baby smell, a distinctive scent that seemed to come with infants. Her, Mrs. Carpenter said. I've named her Cecilia. Cecilia. She stopped in front of a small stone fireplace. Would you like to hold her? Sure. Maya accepted the bundle Mrs. Carpenter offered her. Putting the baby close to her chest, Maya inhaled and smelled nothing. She took another sniff. Nope, not a single thing. That was weird. Maya shifted the baby, carefully cradling the baby's head with one hand. While the other hand... Oh, sorry, with the other hand, Maya pushed back the blanket that swathed... Sw sway, swathed... <laughs> what is this word? She, Maya pushed back the blanket that covered the infant's face. Maya gasped, and she almost dropped Mrs. Carpenter's baby. Mrs. Carpenter's baby?! Maya gazed in horror at the thing she was holding. It was all she could do not to thrust it back at Mr. Mrs. Carpenter and run screaming from the house. Swallowing hard, aware of sweat trickling down her spine, Maya looked up at Mrs. Carpenter. Mrs. Carpenter beamed at Maya, then looked with, jo with pride and joy at her new daughter. Maya shifted her gaze to Noelle. Had Noelle seen what Maya was holding? Yes, Noelle was looking right at the baby's face. But really, there was no face to look at. There was a head, yes, but the head was featureless. It looked like an unfinished, see-through doll's head. Struggling to keep her expression composed, Maya started rocking back and forth as if she was holding a real baby. With a cravering voice, she began singing a lullaby. Noelle started talking to Mrs. Carpenter about feeding schedules and Maya turned away from her friend and her teacher. She surrep 
potentially peeled black back the blanket so she could see the whole of the thing in her arms. No, this wasn't a baby. She didn't know what it was, but it wasn't a baby. Smooth and limp, like a jelly-filled, lifeless ragdoll, the floppy content of the baby blanket was an inert mannequin baby, contained in a revolting, slick, translucent skin. <laughs> this isn't even the worst part. <laughs> Beneath the skin, the very faintest outlines of pale blue filaments extended throughout the thing's body. They looked like veins, sort of. Other than these barely perceptible strands, or perceptible strands. The thing's filling was as clear as its outer covering. The summer before Mayo and her friends had visited the Pizzaplex for her AR birthday celebration, Jackson had dragged Noelle and Mayer to a sci-fi movie about cloning. The thing Mayer held reminded her of the unfinished clones. It wasn't an infant. It was like a placeholder for an inf infant. Shall I take her? Mrs. Carpenter said. Mayo whirled around. She tried to find her voice, but she couldn't. She silently nodded and returned the flaccid, what? Being? Creature? Not baby, that was for sure. Maya handed Cecilia to her mother. Can I get you girls a snack? Mrs. Carpenter asked. No, thank you, Maya said, just as Noelle said. Sure. Mrs. Carpenter looked from Maya to Noelle. Maya frowned at her friend. I need to get back home, Maya told Mrs. Carpenter. I have a lot to do. It was sweet of you two to visit. Mrs. Carpenter said. Cecilia likes being the centre of attention. <laughs> oh, I just got chills. I got chills. <laughs> oh, this writing is great. Mrs. Carpenter looked down at Cecilia as if the baby was the cutest thing in the world. Don't you, little one? Mrs. Carpenter nuzzled the baby's smooth, flat, squishy face. Maya felt nauseous. Um, we need to go. Bye, Mrs. Carpenter. Maya grabbed Noelle's hand and pulled her friend out of the teacher's house. In the driveway outside, Maya sucked in the air that smelled of ozone, smelled of me, that doesn't smell great, anyway, and damp earth. The thunderstorm had left as quickly as it had arrived. The ground was soaked, and the sun's warmth was turning the wetness into steam that drifted up from the dirt and pavement like fair ephemeral ghosts. <laughs> I don't know what that means. Maya leaned over and held her stomach. She felt dizzy and weak. Are you okay? Noelle asked. Maya straightened. She shot Noelle a baffled look. Didn't you see that? See what? Cecilia, she's a cute baby. Noelle studied Maya. What's wrong with you? Maya didn't have time to think much more about Mrs. Carpenter's baby the rest of that day. Well, that wasn't true. Even though she was busy, Maya really couldn't think of anything but Mrs. Carpenter's baby. And Noelle's weird reaction to her. But it creeped Maya out so much she forced herself to focus on something else every time the image of the droopy, dollish infant thing entered her mind. By the end of the day, she'd convinced herself she'd imagine the whole thing. Besides, the news she got over dinner shoved aside everything else. Her mom now had cancer. They gave Maya this news, calmly as Maya's mum dished up beef stew, and her dad handed around the bread basket, a basket that con contained rolls that reminded C Maya of Cecilia's featureless head. Nope. Stop it, she told herself. She was not going to think about that. Maya handed the basket to Elena without taking a roll. Maya wasn't hungry anyway. She picked up a sp her spoon and swirled it in her stew, making circular patterns in the tarragon-scented broth. Her parents were going to die. How could they sit here eating as if everything was okay? Why was Elena chattering about her upcoming college classes? Maya dropped her spoon with a clatter. Elena, stop it! Elena froze with a baby head. No, bread roll, halfway to her mouth. She lifted her eyebrows. What's your problem? She asked Maya. How are you going to be able to go to school if mom and dad are gone? Maya asked. She looked from Elena to her parents. Maya's dad patted Maya's hand. Oh, don't worry, sweetie. You and Elena will be fine. I know it seems like we don't have much, but we've been saving. There's plenty of funds to get you both through school, and this house is paid for. Maya's dad returned to peacefully eating his stew as if he'd just been discussing the day's thunderstorm. <laughs> This is wonderful, hun, he said to Maya's mum, as usual. Maya's mum smiled. She picked up the bread basket and offered it to Maya. Are you sure we don't... Are you, sorry. Are you sure you don't want to roll, sweetie? Maya erupted from her chair, covered her mouth, and ran from the room. She barely made it to the bathroom before she threw up. Did she have cancer now too? No, Maya didn't have cancer. 
Her mum took her to the hospital the next day. Doctors ran the usual tests. Maya, unlike most of the world's population now, was completely fine. Although fine wasn't the right word to describe Maya at all. There was nothing fine about her. Maya was a wreck. Although school had started again, it wasn't the way Maya had envisioned her senior year. For one thing, most of the regular teachers were dead or dying. Half her, si her, half her class was sick. Maya's favourite activity, choir, was cancelled, as were most extracurricular activities. There weren't enough participants, and even so, no one acted as if anything was wrong. Maya had never liked watching the news. No one in her family did. They preferred talking about happy events and doing fun things than keeping up with what was going on uh, what was going wrong in the world. But lately, Maya couldn't stop watching the news. She found herself glued to the TV screen whenever she was within range of one. It was like watching a car wreck. It was horrifying, but she couldn't help herself. The news memori- sorry. The news mesmerised her not because it was all doom and gloom though. In fact, the news was the exact opposite of the panic that would be reasonable in the current situation. Instead of sober reports of illness and death, the newscasts provided uh, sprightly updates on the number of people diagnosed, being treated and dying. It was like watching a ticker tape of cancer stats, all scrolling across the screen to a backdrop of upbeat instrumental music and the newscasters chirpy narration. I love it so much. Another th 342,128 people died in China yesterday, Bob, a poofy-haired female news anchor announced, as if giving a football score. How are things in Europe? Similar, Pam. The last count was 312,572, Bob responded. Britain has passed a mass cremation law to handle the large numbers of deceased. <laughs> yes, Britain. Go on. <laughs> this is my favourite part of the story. Um, if you don't know, after reading the story, go watch my my uh, if, like my news reports in under construction video because I basically made this into a into a sketch. Anyway, as freaky as these emotionless reports were, though. They weren't what kept Maya awake at night. Her eyes weren't glued open in the darkness because of the cancer. Not even her own sick family kept her awake. No, what kept her from closing her eyes were the babies. Or really, the not babies. She couldn't stop thinking about the unfinished, vaguely baby-shaped things that were now passing for newborns in the world. Mrs Carpenter Cecilia was the first one that Maya saw, but now she knew that Cecilia wasn't an aberration. All new infants looked like Cecilia. None of the babies were normal. And worse than that, not only were they not born normal, but these new children also weren't growing normally either. A couple days after seeing Cecilia for the first time, Maya had gone to the pharmacy. Skirting around a sidewalk under construction sign, haha, <laughs> Maya had spotted Mrs. Carpenter getting into her car. Hi, Mrs. Carpenter, Maya had called. Hi, Maya. How's Cecilia? Maya had asked, just to be polite. She didn't really want to know anything about the thing Mrs. Carpenter had called her baby. Oh, she's great, Mrs. Carpenter had said, and she gestured toward the passenger seat of her SUV. Looking past Miss Carpenter, Maya had glanced at the bundle she'd expected to see strapped into a baby carrier. But what she saw on the passenger seat wasn't a baby-sized bundle. It was a child-sized... what? Mass? So unstructured that it was a little more than... Well, it was little more than a vaguely human-shaped outline. The thing that Mrs. Carpenter called Cecilia was a drooping pile of gooey material spilling over the edges of the passenger seat. And somehow we have Fazgoo number two, my friends. <laughs> <coughs> <coughs> Not quite. I think we'd all go insane if it was Fazgoo number two. Although this is probably worse than Fazgoo. Uh, unmoving, the child thing drooped across the leather lifelessly. But it wasn't lifeless. How could it be? It had more than quadrupled in size in just two days. And Mrs. Carpenter clearly didn't think this was strange. She probably didn't think it was strange because these inert mannequin creatures were everywhere now. Maya couldn't go anywhere without seeing one of the nauseating things in some stage of development. By Christmas, Maya's parents were ensconed in hospital beds in the family living room with ivy drips in their arms. They lay with their hands linked watching old movies while Maya ran around trying to keep up with the care. Their care and Elena's care. Elena was sick now too. She was the last of Maya's loved ones to get diagnosed. Sus. <laughs> Elena. Um, Jackson and Noel were dying. All Maya's cousins were dying. Mr and Mrs Davis were gone. 
The twins were on their own, and they were sick and dying. Mrs. Thompson had already died, but Mrs. Thompson was hanging on barely. She was dying, and now her children were sick and dying too. Everyone was dying, and the jelly-filled doll babies were being born right and left, growing. It seemed faster and faster with each pa passing day. Unsettling numbers of them had started showing up in public. They were amassing in parking lots, accumulating on street corners. They didn't move around, they just lay in clumps, like mounds of humanoid-looking debris, stacking up because no one was removing it. Maya couldn't understand why the mounds kept getting big and bigger and bigger. Where were they coming from? A couple days before Christmas, Pastor Ben visited the house. When Maya opened the front door hesitantly, dreading that she'd find one of the new neighbour children, aka doll things, lying on the porch, she was beyond relieved to see her minister smiling at her as if he didn't have a care in the world. Maya threw her arms around the broad-shouldered man with the unruly blonde hair. Pastor Ben, you're still alive! Maya hadn't been to church in months. When was there time for church? Besides, she'd seen on the news that churches had been turned into clinics for the dying. Still kicking, Pastor Ben chuckled. Apparently it's not my time, yet. Maya looked closely at Pastor Ben, and she realised he was sick too. His skin had the same grey pallor she was seeing in everyone she knew and everyone she didn't know. He'd lost a lot of weight since she'd seen him last. He looked like a human hanger for his black shirt and slacks. His white liturgical collar was now two sizes too big for him. Pretending that all was well, Maya opened the door and ushered Pastor Ben into the house. She motioned toward the living room where their parents were weakly, but gamely, singing, ha singing Christmas carols. Pastor Ben smiled widely as he greeted Maya's mom and dad. What a joyful noise, he exclaimed. As if it was perfectly normal, Pastor Ben grabbed the dining room chair and pulled it up next to Maya's dad's bed. Then he joined in the singing, adding his full baritone to Maya's mom's thready soprano and her dad's raspy tenor. Uh, Pastor Ben motioned to Maya, but she didn't have a single fa la 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 left in her. She gave him a wan smile and said, I've got to... She ran from the room before she could finish. She was in the kitchen making a peanut butter sandwich for Elena when Pastor Ben wandered in a few minutes later. She looked at him and dropped the knife she held. What's going on, Pastor Ben? Why is everyone dying? Pastor Ben lowered himself onto a kitchen chair. It's not for us to ask why. We're given each day to live, not to question. But what about those things everywhere? Maya asked. Ben frowned in confusion. Things? Maya gestured toward the street. The jelly people. Pastor Ben still looked lost. Maya threw up her hands, exasperated. Those things that are like dolls made out of silicone inside plastic wrap. Ben shook his head. The Lord doesn't distinguish life based on its appearance. All life is sacred. <laughs> but those things are lifeless, Maya shouted. They're just... Is that peanut butter? Pastor Ben interrupted. I could use a sandwich. It seems like I never have time to eat. What with all the funerals and baptisms. Maya goggled at her minister. You baptise those things? Pastor Ben smiled. It's part of my job, Maya. Maya shook her head. What more could she say? She felt like she was on a sinking ship and no one but her knew what was going on. No matter how much she ran around trying to sound the alarm, everyone continued to go about their business as if the world was as it should have been. As it should have been, sorry. Sighing, Maya put, her, put the sandwich she'd been making for Elena on her saucer. She handed it to Pastor Ben. She patted her hand in thanks. Lifting the sandwich, Pastor Ben said, The world is a paradox, Maya. A balance of good and bad. People are dying, yes, but... Life is proliferating. Not only are babies being born at an unprecedented rate, but they're also growing into adolescence and then adults in a manner of just days instead of years. Tragedies and miracles tend to go hand in hand. Maya didn't even try to argue with Pastor Ben about his use of the word babies. He was seeing what he wanted. He was seeing what wasn't there. Or maybe she was the one seeing what wasn't there. Were the jelly beings real? Yes, they had to be. Maya wasn't imaginative enough to conjure up those horrible things. Over the next several days, Maya tried to find the miracles Pastor Ben had talked about, but it was hopeless. The minister was as delusional as everyone else. One night, late, after Maya had cleaned up Elena's vomit, emptied her parents' 
bedpans and sung her mother, whose pain was no longer manageable, to sleep, Maya went outside to a dormant flower garden. Sitting on the little wooden bench her father had made for her a few years before, she stared at the brittle, bloomless stalks and tried to remember the lively colours that used to fill the yard in the summer. As soon as she tried to picture the flowers, she realised she was having trouble seeing colour at all. Everything was so faded and grey now. The sick and the dying. They were hewless shells. And the new mannequin things? They were sheer vessels, filled with nothing but limpid gel, like human-shaped jellyfish. As she'd done many times since her world had started falling apart, Maya felt for a gold rose. She held it tightly as she leaned back and looked up at the constellations. Although the world beneath them no longer shone brightly, the stars still sparkled in the opaque expanse of the night sky. Oh my god. <laughs> a teardrop actually just left my eye. This is crazy. How, how am I crying about this? Wait. Oh, this is, this is actually, okay. Give me one second to have a drink. I don't know how that part was so melancholic for me. I don't know. This is just really good writing. Honestly, it's just really well done, I think. Um, really, Lally's game as a book has really improved from the Fazbear Fright, I think. There's a lot of emotion uh, and there's a lot of good twists and turns and I love it. A lot of surprise, that's what I like. She inhaled sharply and sat up straight. The sparkle had triggered a memory, a reminder of the AR unit in the pizza plex. <coughs> that was when it had all started going wrong, wasn't it? Maya put her hand to her temple. The barely perceptible head pain that was a daily companion had begun the morning after she was in the AR booth. But what did that pain have to do with everything else? Maya tried to remember when her gran was first diagnosed with cancer. She couldn't recall how long after her birthday it was when Gran got sick. She probably didn't remember because at the time it wasn't noteworthy. Of course it was upsetting and sad, but it wasn't in any way peculiar. What if? Maya! A weak voice called out. Maya let go of the, ro the, go the gold rose pendant, jumped up and dashed into the house. Was that her mum or Elena? She ran first to her mum and found her asleep. She tore down the hall to her bedroom. Elena was reaching for the plastic bin on the nightstand. Maya grabbed it and positioned it under Elena's chin as she held her sister's hair while Elena threw up for the up up umpteenth time that day. Maya chastised herself for taking the time to sit outside. She didn't have the luxury of sitting under the stars and she didn't have time to ask what if. All Maya had time for the next day and the next and the next was running from one sick family member or friend to the other. She no longer bothered to go to school. There were only a few classes available anyway. She wouldn't have left the house at all if she could have helped it. She hated being out in the street. The jelly mannequins were all over now. They seemed to be multiplying faster and faster. They cluttered up the stores and blocked the sidewalks. There were knots of them everywhere that Maya had to go. Um, and how did they get there? And how did they get where they were? Maya had never seen one of the things move. They had limbs, but the limbs didn't seem to work. They could only lie around. They didn't talk either. How could they? They didn't have mouths. They didn't have organs or blood or brains. They weren't human. They were just pretend humans, inexplicably growing objects that never grew into anything that actually functioned. And they didn't just grow, they multiplied on their own. One day, on their way to Jackson's house, Maya nearly crashed her bike when she saw one of the transparent creatures suddenly produce a smaller trans transparent creature. This is horrifying. <laughs> Maya wasn't close enough to the things, thankfully, to see clearly what happened. But it looked like the new lank unlife slipped out of the larger one like an infant coming out the birth canal. <laughs> well worded. Uh, Maya clapped a hand over her mouth to stifle a scream. How is this possible? The piles of jelly beings were birthing more jelly beings. Don't you think it's bizarre? Maya asked Jackson as she sat next to his bed one afternoon. She was trying to get him to swallow a protein drink. Jackson's parents had died weeks before. So had his older sister. He hadn't let that bother him. I can take care of myself. We're all having to do that now, right? After he'd buried his family, he'd gone on as if everything was hunky-dory. He still read his science and philosophy books. He still danced to music blasting from his boombox. But then he got sick too. He'd gone downhill fast. Jackson sipped. Oh, sorry, Jackson managed to sip 
of the vanilla protein shake Maya offered him, but he immediately spit it out. The sour vanilla odour made Maya's nose twitch. Maya tried again, but Jackson weakly pushed the bottle away. What's bizarre? he asked. His previously deep voice was barely audible, and it was scratchy, like his vocal cords were caught in brambles. All the... things out there. Maya waved her hand toward the street. As she turned that way, she caught a glimpse of several of the gossamer jelly creatures piled up outside the window. Jackson looked toward the window and shrugged. All experiences are valid, he coughed. Blood stained his lower lip. Jackson, uh, sorry, Maya reached out and wiped Jackson's mouth. She looked at the clock. She had to go home and check on Elena. But what about Jackson? He could no longer take care of himself. Neither could Noelle. Her family was gone too. Maya had been racing from her house to Noelle's to Jackson for, to several of her neighbours' houses for days. Only her parents, her two youngest cousins, and her sister were left in her own family. She'd moved her cousins into her own house so she could watch over them. I have to go, Maya said. I'm not sure my parents are going to last the rest of the day. Maya set the protein drink on Jackson's nightstand. Drink this when you can. It occurred to her that she just talked about her parents' imminent death without crying. She figured her tear drugs had dried up. Oh gosh, I said that wrong. Whatever. You know what I mean. I'll be back in the morning. Maya checked Jackson's IV. She quickly replaced the bags dispensing, uh, d the bag dispensing his medication. She might have run out of tears, Maya thought, but she'd gained more nursing skills than she'd ever expected to have. When she'd started caring for all her six friends and relatives, she could barely handle the cleaning duties without getting sick herself. Now she could wipe up puke and pee and whatever else the body needed to expel without batting an eye. On top of that, she can now give painless shots and easily switch out IV catheters. Uh, Mrs. Thompson had taught her how to do that before the women got so sick she couldn't do anything at all. May have thought back to when she used to have dreams for her future. Sometimes she thought about being a doctor. Sometimes she thought about being a biologist or a botanist. Now she didn't think about being anything. All she could do was be there for the people she loved. And she needed to move if she was going to be there for everyone left in her care. Maya leaned over and kissed Jackson's forehead, one of his greasy locks brushed against her cheek. Don't worry about me, Jackson rasped. Go take care of your sister. Jackson's eyes fluttered closed. He was asleep. Maya adjusted his covers. Then she left his house. Skirting the jelly people, she cycled back home. By the time Maya returned to her house, she was shocked to find it nearly surrounded by mounds of all of the mannequin things. There were so many of them in the road, on the sidewalks and in the alley behind the house that they seemed to have more like one organism. They seemed to be more like one organism instead of several individual sacks of translucent jelly. Maya barely managed to squeeze past a conglomeration of the things to get in her front door. Inside, she slammed the door closed and bolted it. Then she ran to the front window and dropped the blinds. It was only after plunging the room into total darkness that she realised that, that she turned to check on her parents, and she realised she wasn't hearing what she should have been hearing. For the past few days, her parents' breathing had been phlegmy and laboured. They inhaled as if sucking through a straw, and they exhaled in a watery rattle that Maya could barely stand to listen to. The sound of their struggle to get air had been relentless. It had seemed to echo through the house, reaching Maya no matter where she was or what she was doing. But now that sound was gone. Maya switched on a lamp and crossed to her mum's side. Her mum was still, her eyes open and glazed. Maya gently closed her mother's eyes. Shifting her gaze to her dad, Maya saw that his eyes were already closed. But he was just as motionless. He was gone too. Maya waited to linger by her parents' side, but she didn't have time. She'd been gone too long. She needed to check her sister and her cousins. I love you, mum and dad, she whispered. Then she ran to her parents' bedroom. Maya had put her youngest cousins in her parents' queen-sized bed. She'd surrounded them with pillows so they couldn't fall out of bed. Now she picked up Axel and held him close. His cheeks were no longer pudgy. He hadn't smiled in a long time, but he was still accepting milk or juice from his favourite froggy sippy cup. Maya quickly got the cup and nudged the cup's opening into Axel's slack mouth. As she urged him to drink, she checked on his, his sister, Abril, uh, Abril, or Ab I don't know, that's a weird name to me, sorry. <laughs> Abril, who was five. Abril had always been a tornado of a child, whirling constantly because she loved to dance, or whipping from one activity to the other. She'd never actually been able to stay still, and now 
Abel barely moved. Her usual perky and shiny pigtails were limp and lusterless. Maya wanted to wash Abel's hair for days, but feeding Abel and her brother and the others Maya had left to care for took precedence. Abel, Nina, Ninya, Ninya, uh, Maya said. The little girl's eyes fluttered open. Can you eat something? Continuing to hold the sippy cup for Axel, Maya tried to hand a small container of pudding to Abel. Abel co closed her eyes and screwed up her face. She, took, she shook her head. I'm pretty sure I'm not saying this name right. I'm really sorry. I'm just saying Abel now. At the same time, Axel reared back from the sippy cup and threw up all over Maya's chest. Maya quickly settled the boy in the bed and made sure he hadn't aspirated any of the vomit. She cleaned up him up as best as she could and then hurried to the bathroom. Pulling off her shirt, Maya washed herself off. She left the bathroom and headed towards her bedroom. Grabbing a t-shirt from the back of the door, she pulled it on. She made a face when she got a whiff of sweat. Sorry, This shirt wasn't much cleaner than, one she, than the one she'd taken off, but she was out of clean clothes. She hadn't had time to do laundry and she couldn't remember the last time. Elena, lying limply in her bed, moaned. Maya rushed to her side. Checking the IV stand, she saw that Elena's intravenous bag was empty. She was in pain. Maya reached for a new bag. That's when she realised that there wasn't one. She'd forgotten to restock the supplies. She had to go back out. Oh my gosh. <laughs> <coughs> oh. When it had become clear that medical personnel couldn't keep up with all the sick and dying people, the government had set up chemotherapy dispensaries in every town. If you had insurance, you could just pick up the medication and administer it yourself instead of going to the chemo wards if you were well enough to get it. Maya was the only one left in her family in her neighbourhood who was strong enough to go anywhere. The last time she'd been up to the dispensary, she tried to stock up with enough for everyone she was helping. Obviously, she hadn't gotten enough. After giving Elena as much water as she'd accept and trying, unsuccessfully, to give Axel and Abel more food, Maya had grabbed the car keys and headed into the garage. The dispensary was too far away for a bike ride, and besides, the jelly people made bikes, bike rides harrowing. It wasn't that these partially formed humanoid sacks were dangerous. As far as Maya had been able to tell, the empty beings that looked like vaguely human-shaped clear water balloons were benign. They didn't have enough substance to be malevolent. And even if they were, what could they do? They couldn't move. But their existence was enough to creep out Maya. The things, in their very wrongness, sent shivers skittering along Maya's spine. Because they were so unnatural, the dull people unsettled Maya, and if she stopped to think about it, Maya fully expected them to become a threat sooner or later. The sheer volume of them was chilling. How, would, how long would it be before they covered the entire surface of the planet? She made sure she didn't stop to think about that very often. In the garage, Maya started her family's minivan before she hit the garage door opener. If the jelly people weren't headed in the driveway, or sorry, heaped in the driveway, Maya didn't want to risk spilling into the garage before she could get the van going. Maya barely waited for the garage door to clear the top of the van before she put it in reverse and hit the gas. As she'd feared, several of the eerie mannequin things were in the driveway. Well, she'd plow right over them if she needed to. Maya backed hard out of the garage and hit the opener button again. Because her gaze was on the road behind her, Maya wasn't sure if any of the jelly things slopped into her garage. She figured if they did, she'd deal with that later. Once she had the van in the street, it was relatively easy to navigate through the collections of dummy sacks. Besides the mannequin thingies, uh, the streets were mostly empty. Nearly everyone was either sick or at home taking care of the sick. Maya only saw a few cars as she navigated through town. The rest were parked into their driveways or tucked into their garages. Some were in parking lots, but most of the lots were empty. People were dying, but they weren't dropping dead where they stood. That was what was weird about everything. It wasn't like a zombie apocalypse, apocalypse or anything. There wasn't a virus or a killing chemical released by a foreign country. It was cancer. And although the disease was killing people quickly, everyone had time to get to a hospital or to their home to die. That was why Maya's community now looked like a ghost town, quite literally. The dull things, if you ignored their odd jelly consistency and the fact that they didn't go anywhere, were uncannily similar to spectres. But Maya knew they weren't ghosts. They weren't, well, they weren't anything, actually. They had no heart, no emotion, they had no spirit. They were like globs of nothingness in plastic containers, like human leftovers. 
When Maya had first seen Ce Cecilia, the baby's head had reminded Maya of her family's dinner rolls, but now she saw the jelly things as more uncooked dough than a finished product of any kind. They were like batter waiting to go in the oven and get baked. <laughs> Can't wait for myself to get baked. Uh, ne <laughs> nearing the dispensary, Maya's way was blocked by a road under construction sign. She started to make a right turn to, to tour around it, but then she braked and stared at the sign. What was it with all the under construction signs she'd been seeing? Maya frowned, her mind flipping back to other such signs, starting with the one that had been in the front of the AI unit. She tapped her fingers on the steering wheel as she tried to attach meaning to how often she'd seen such signs. Her brain, however, couldn't come up with any coherent ideas about it. Finally, she shrugged and shook her head. She got the car moving again. Maya was able to drive the rest of the way to the dispensary without incident. There, it was a bit more challenging to avoid the aggregations of jelly things to get into the flat-roofed industrial building, but she managed it. There was only one woman left on the duty behind the desk. She didn't appear to be much older than Maya. She might have been a college student before all of this had started, and she'd probably been pretty. Now she was obviously sick herself. Her eyes were sunken, and her complexion was the colour of ash. Brushing a strand of oily brown hair from her face, the woman wiped away at Maya's attempt to fill out the right paperwork. Just take what you need. The woman's voice was barely a whisper, like tissue paper rustling in an air current. Maya didn't argue. She filled the tote bags she'd brought with her with as many intravenous bags of medication she could stuff into them. Then she, sh then she rushed out of the building. In the parking lot, Maya was shocked to see that several piles of jelly people now ringed the outermost rows. Had they been there when she arrived? Had they just not noticed them? Maya didn't stop to consider the question because one large pyramid of the jelly people was now close to the minivan. She ran to the vehicle, threw in the tote bags and slammed the door shut. She had the engine turned over and they ran in gear just as several new jelly beings tumbled off the nearest pile and landed near the front bumper. She backed up fast and tore out of the parking lot. Purposefully, Maya kept her gaze straight ahead. She was not going to look in the rearview mirror to see what was behind her. On the way home, Maya considered stopping by the grocery store. She filled the kitchen with canned soups, cartons of pudding, and bottles of protein drinks, but she figured she should add to what she had. When she got to the store, though, the parking lot was nearly buried by the jelly things. They were everywhere, like jiggly containerless, containerless gelatin. She couldn't face even trying to make her way through the quivering mass. She headed back to her neighbourhood. Maya's street was thick with the pellucid creatures when she reached it. She gazed down her road to the house. It looked like her driveway had turned into a massive heap of jello. She looked to her right. The van was idling in front of the Thompsons' house, and only a few of the mannequin things were lying around the two-story structure. Maya was trying to take care of the last surviving member of the family, Donnie. She figured she might as well leave the car there and run in on to check, to, to check on him. She could hopefully jog home behind the houses, keeping away from as many jelly people as possible. Maya pulled into the Thompson's driveway. She quickly got out of the car, slinging her tote bags of medicine across her body. Running around behind the house, she let herself in the back door, closed it, and locked it behind her. Donnie, it's me, she called out. A weak groan answered her. Maya set the totes on the cluttered kitchen table. She sighed as she glanced around the dirty, neglected room. Gone were the shining surfaces and well-ordered plans, oh, sorry, pans and utensils she was used to seeing in Mr. Mrs. Thompson's domain. The sink was piled with dishes. The granite counters were smeared with stains. Maya didn't want to think about what fluids they were. The room smelled putrid, like spoiled food. Uh, Maya tried to remember sitting in the Thompson's kitchen, eating snickerdoodles, and listening to Mr. Thompson bad no Mr. Thompson's bad knock-knock jokes. Maya could almost hear him now. Knock knock. Who's there? C cancer. Cancer who? Cancer. See, I'm busy. Oh my god. <laughs> oh my god this story gets worse and worse that's that's a very nice touch in this story i like that that's amazing uh that's a very dark joke for a uh fnaf book honestly jesus okay that had been the last joke he told her she'd forced herself to pretend to laugh and she had cried copiously when he'd pressed an, uh, an envelope full of cash into her hand. Take care of the kids until child services arrive, he'd asked pleadingly. Maya had nodded. She didn't have the heart to tell him that child services couldn't keep up with all the orphaned kids. 
should take care of Donnie, Parker and Aurora until the end. As she reached into the fridge for a fruit cup now, Maya wondered if the memories of her happy times in this room had really been in this lifetime. It seemed like it happened to another Maya, maybe in one of those parallel realities Jackson used to, to like to talk about. Maya froze with one hand in the fridge. Parallel reality. Was this real? She returned to the what if question that had been nagging her ever since she looked up the stairs. What if this wasn't real? After all, how could it be real? Everyone dying of cancer. The streets filled with fast growing jelly beings. What if she was still in the AR booth? If she was, how could she tell? Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, she thought back to a big augmented birthday bash. When she'd partied with the crowd of will wishers, or well wishers, sorry, it hadn't felt virtual at all. It had seemed as real as anything else she'd ever experienced. So, how did she know whether this was real? That's. Such an amazing philosophical question. It's probably my favorite philosophical question. Basically, if you're in a simulation, how do you know when you ever escape? Right? Especially if the simulation is like perfect to real life. How, how would you know if you've escaped? What are, the, what are the signs that you've left? It's kind of, it's really chilling to think about. And that's the whole concept of this story, I think, possibly. I don't know. We'll talk about theories at the end. Well, in a separate video, probably, but... Um, where was I? Maya grabbed a fruit cup and pulled her hand from the fridge. She closed the fridge door with a muted wump. The fridge hummed and Maya remained where she was, mesmerised by the sound until a thud came from the back of the house. Maya jerked her out, herself out of the... Her, eh. Maya jerked herself out of her trance, quickly grabbed a bag of medicine from the tote and trotted out of the kitchen. It had sounded like Donnie had fallen out of bed. She hurried to his room. Sure enough, Donnie was on the floor. What are you doing down there, bud? Maya asked him brightly as if his face wasn't contorted in pain, as if his lips weren't cracked, and as if he wasn't uh, as skeletal as a cadaver. Donnie mumbled something that sounded like brrrr, but she knew he was going to, she was going to try her. He'd dropped Bert, his stuffed alligator. Maya picked up the fallen spittle-encrusted plush toy, then she effortlessly lifted what was left of the rambunctious little boy she used to play hide and seek with. Can you eat some fruit? She asked, holding up the fruit cup. Donnie shook his head. Maya sighed and switched out his intravenous bag. When is this going to end? Come on. She glanced at her watch as she did. She had to go back home. Elena had been without meds for too long and she had to try and get something in Abril and Axel. On the way, she could check on the Davies twins. Or Davis twins. I'm saying all these names like differently now. I don't know why. I am in a different world. Uh, Maya set the fruit cup on Donnie's nightstand. She tucked Bert under the under Donnie's lax arm. I'll be back, kiddo. She told him. He blinked up at her. His eyes shifted as if he was realizing who she was. For a second, his face looked more animated. Weakly, he lifted a hand and pointed across the room. Maya turned and scanned the shelves that hugged the wall opposite Donnie's bed. What was he pointing at? Pfft, Donnie said. Maya glanced at his face. His expression was intense. He was determined that she understood. Maya crossed to the shelves, and she saw it. There was a clumsily wrapped package with her name on it, on the shelf. With a shaking hand, she picked it up. A piece of red folded construction paper was taped to the package. She opened the paper and read, Happy birthday, Maya. She recognised Donnie's large, crooked lettering. Maya looked back at Donnie. He was watching her with more attentiveness than she'd seen in him for days. She returned to his bed and opened the package. Pulling out a vase, a tin can sprayed with gold and decorated with gold-painted rocks, she discovered that her tears hadn't dried up after all. They spilled from her eyes and cascaded down her cheeks as she looked at Donnie's strained but eager face. This is beautiful, she exclaimed. Donnie blinked. Then he closed his eyes, satisfied. Maya realised the gift must have been sitting there ever since her 17th non-birthday. He'd probably forgotten about it. Why had he remembered now? Wiping her eyes, Maya leaned over and kissed Donnie's forehead. She held the vase against her heart and she left the room. Back in the kitchen, Maya splashed water on her face. She grabbed her tote bags, tucking the vase in with the medicine. She glanced out the kitchen window and tensed when she saw how many more jelly people were going in the Thompson's front yard. She was going to have to sneak out the back door and go down the alley. She slipped into the utility room off the kitchen and gingerly cracked open the door. Maya exhaled in relief. 
The Thompsons' backyard was empty of the mannequin things. She stepped out of the house and closed and locked the door behind her. Trotting to the back of the property, she eased into the alley. She froze. Here, the way wasn't so clear. The alley was thick with the clear-skinned creatures. There would be no way to avoid them completely. They didn't form a solid mass, though. Maya figured she was able to weave her way around them. She took a deep breath, and she took off at the fast jog. Six houses stood between the Thompsons' house and Maya's home. The first one belonged to Mr. Vance, the mean old man who kicked his dog. Uh... Oh... Uh, no, sorry, I was just thinking of something. Uh, Maya glanced in his back window as she passed it, and she nearly stumbled when she saw him watching her. He was still alive? She thought all the old people were dead. The man was probably too ornery to die, she thought, as she picked up her pace. The Davis twins were two doors down from her. It only took her seconds to get to their back fence. Unfortunately, though, the back of the Davis house was surrounded by the see-through skins. Maya's pace faltered. Should she try it? Studying the creatures around the Davis house, Maya thought she saw a path through them. But then, as she watched, the path disappeared. The things were reproducing faster and faster now, right before Maya's eyes. This was as close as she'd ever been to them while they churned out more of themselves. She could actually see their jug jiggling masses convulsing before ejecting new smaller versions of themselves. They did this over and over. They were spawning. <laughs> <laughs> Slash set world spawn. Uh, no, she couldn't risk going into the Davis house. She needed to get Elena and her cousin sooner rather than later. The twins would have to wait. Maya picked up her pace again. Maya dodged around a horde of jelly creatures. Then she ran full out, uh, sorry, then she ran full out to the back of her house. There she was dismayed to see that her beloved garden was buried in the gelatinous people things. There was barely enough room for her to zip past them and get in the back door. As she passed the last of the creatures before fumbling the door open, she brushed against it. The cold, oily feel of the thing's skin made her shudder. Bile rose up in the back of her throat. She swallowed it down and slammed the back door closed. She bolted it and leaned against its solid wood panels, her chest heaving. For several seconds, Maya couldn't move. Her own limbs felt as insubstantial as those of the things outside her door. A faint cry coming from her parents' room got her going again. I'm coming, she called. She couldn't tell if it was Axel or Abril who had cried out. When she got into the room, she realised it was Abril. Uh, Abril Levine, I'm joking. Uh, <laughs> Axel was unconscious. His little fists curled tightly around the top of the dirty blanket that covered him. Maya cringed at the sight of the filth. She had to find time to wash linens and get everyone cleaned up. Rushing to Abril's side, Maya dropped the totes and picked up the pudding container she'd left for the little girl. It hadn't been open, of course. Abril thrashed in the bed, a painful grimace on her face. Maya grabbed a uh, Abril and wrapped her in a hug. I'm here, Nina. I'm here. Abril moaned and cried out again. Maya brushed Abril's wet, matted hair from her clammy forehead. She rocked the child in her arms and started humming a lullaby. Maya wasn't sure how long she hummed and rocked. Quite a while, she decided, when she realised that one of her arms had gone numb from supporting Abril's weight. Maya eased her cousin back onto the bed. Then she looked over at Axel. Axel's fists were no longer clenched. His little hands were slacked. So was his face. He was gone. Maya closed her eyes, waiting for the tears to flow again. They didn't come. Maybe she'd used up her reserves when she'd seen Donnie's gift. Opening her eyes, Maya leaned over and kissed a Axel's already cooling skin. Goodbye, my sweet boy, she whispered. Her spirit as numb as her arm, Maya stood. She turned and left her parents' bedroom. Straightening her shoulders, she headed down the hall to check on Elena. Would she be gone too? Would it be so bad if she was? Just outside her doorway, Maya sank to the floor. She closed her eyes and let her head fall back against the wall with a thunk. She barely felt the impact. She couldn't do it anymore. Who was she kidding? There was no way she could keep up with trying to feed and medicate for the people that were left for her to care for. What was the point? Everyone was going to die. Everyone but Maya. Maya opened her eyes. Why wasn't she getting sick? Why did it seem to be happening to everyone around her? It was as if she was at the focal point of everything. Just like she had been at her big per birthday party. Maybe she was still in the AR unit. Maya touched her forehead where the faint pain was still discernible. She'd been far too busy to pay attention to it, but it was there. Was it there because the headband was still in place? Maya shook her head. No, this was all just too intense to be some to be part of some kind of computer-generated scenario. But why was it happening? Had the AR booth somehow augmented the whole world? 
or had she jumped into a parallel universe? Maya sighed. She didn't know enough to answer these questions. Probably no one did. Maya stood. She had to stop feeling sorry for herself. And she still needed to check on Elena. Even if Elena was going to die, she deserved as much comfort as Maya could offer until then. Maya glanced at the bedroom window as she crossed to Elena's bed and she wished she hadn't. Just in the time she'd spent in the hallway, the jelly beings outside her house had multiplied alarmingly. A mountain of them was pressing against the house, as if trying to merge with the dwelling. Maya stared at the fragile glass covering the window. Maybe the threat she'd find sliding along with the jelly creatures had finally arrived. But what she could what bleh, but what could she do about it? Maya decided to play ostrich. Out of out of sight, out of mind. She turned her back to the window and went to her sister's side. Elena was so still that Maya thought she was gone. She felt her sister's fragile wrist. No, Ellen, Elena was a alive. Barely. A faint pulse fluttered against her thin skin. Without looking at the window, Maya reached into one of the tote bags and pulled out a bag of medicine. She hooked it up and checked the rate of the drip. She wasn't sure why she was bothering. Elena was obviously unconscious and would probably pass away without waking up. But Maya needed to feel like she was doing something. Maya was starting to lie down on the bed next to her sister when the window behind her shattered. Maya spun around as a series of loud cracks and clatters sounded throughout the house. Maya screamed. The jelly beings were no longer pressing against the house. They were pouring into the house through the broken windows, sloshing through the jagged opening like a transparent octopus with an infinite lumber of legs. The aggregation of vicious humanoids was more liquid than solid. They flowed into the room as if they were a ghastly jellyfish-filled tsunami surging up onto the beach. This is an amazing paragraph. Oh my gosh. Maya whirled toward Eleanor. I keep saying Eleanor. Elena. She bent over to lift her sister, but she realised immediately that Elena was no longer breathing. Her hardly there pulse was gone. Maya didn't want to leave her sister's body in the room, but when something slick started to encircle Maya's ankle, she couldn't think anymore. All she could do was react. She turned and ran from the room. Barreling down the hall, Maya careened around the corner toward the kitchen. She didn't have a solid plan in her head, but some part of her mind thought that if she could get to the garage, she'd be safe. The garage had no windows, and both the garage door and the main door were thick and strong. How long could she hold out in there? She didn't think that far ahead. All she wanted to do now was get away from the squishy mass of gel humanoids. She'd always thought that things were mindless, but now she wondered, did they, had in did they have intention? If they did, what did they want? Maya glanced into the kitchen. She gasped. The kitchen was filled with the creatures. She looked to her left. So was the living room. All the windows in the house were shattered. The front door had been smashed open. The doll things were tumbling toward her from all directions. Even though each individual jelly thing didn't take action on its own, except to push out more jelly things, the congregation of them created movement. They were, they were like specks of dirt. One of them might be harmless, but combined together they had enough weight and force to bury her if they cascaded over her. If the things did have an intention, it was a communal one, and it didn't appear to be a good one. They were slowly but surely surrounding her. Maya lunged for the door leading out to the garage. She flung it open and leaped into the darkness before slamming the door behind her. Instantly, she realised her mistake. When she left the house earlier, she hadn't closed the garage door fast enough. Some of the creatures had obviously fallen in before the door had come down. Maya was overtaken by a squishy, cold, slimy mass. The sensation was disgusting. It felt like she'd been thrown... It felt like she'd thrown herself into a bowl of sticky rice noodles. The jelly beings filled the garage, and now they incorpor incorporated Maya as if she was an essential missing part of their collective. They entwined around her, merging with her, smothering her. Seeking comfort and strength, Maya groped for her gold rose. When she found it, she clenched her fist around it, trying to fill herself with the love it represented. If only it was a magic rose, like ruby shoes, that could transport her back to... Maya's mouth and nose filled with the malleable mush of the creatures that embraced her. She struggled to get air, expecting each breath to be a last. But her last breath didn't come. The spongy, ever-expanding weight burgeoned, bur burgeoned above her, and it felt like her body wouldn't be able to take the pressure any longer. But it did. Maya couldn't see anything. She couldn't hear or smell anything. She'd gone beyond feeling, too. All she was aware of was the force above her, and even that was becoming too much for her mind to comprehend. Why wasn't she dead yet? When would this be over? Maya tried to inhale and couldn't. Hopefully this would end soon. Or would it?
<laughs> yes! We finished on the construction. Oh my god. Oh my god. <laughs> that story is fantastical in so many different ways. Uh, I'm, I, I could talk for hours about this, so I'm going to keep it short. But real quick, uh, the only big problem I have with this story is the mention of the, the word cancer. Uh, they should have used a, like a, a fake disease, like a made-up disease instead of a real-life disease that actually affects people. Um, so, like, I, I really, I respect, like, the real Jake had cancer in it, the frailty had cancer in it, but they were more sentimental stories, especially when they were touching on the cancer parts. This was more kind of comedic to me, uh, and very surreal, and I feel like the disease should have been surreal as well. But uh, either way, amazing. I had so many emotions reading this story. Like, I read the summaries for this story, and even still reading this, I felt chills and I felt um, uh, emotion, even though I knew what, it would ha what was happening. So really, this story is amazing. I know a lot of people don't like it because it's so surreal. To that, I say, that's the point. Uh, yes, she is in a simulation. Yes, she died in the AR game or whatever, and her soul is now in the AR thing. Yes, it is a parallel to Princess Quest. I have a lot of things I can talk about, but it's going to be in my explained video, which is going to be out very soon. Uh, anyway, hopefully you enjoyed. Let me know all your thoughts in the comments below. Thank you for listening and reading with me, and uh, I will see you later. Goodbye.